So um, I work for uh, the local village corporation in Barrow, Alaska. Uh, I've lived there since 1996 and I've been doing archaeology in the North Slope since 1986. Um, the North Slope of Alaska, excuse me, is it okay if I walk yeah, over there? All right. Uh, so the North Slope Borough is a county level government which is about which runs from here to the Canadian border. It is about 230,000 square kilometers. Uh, it has about 6,000 kilometers of coastline. Uh, Alaska itself has half of the coastline in the United States. Um, and so there's a lot of issues with us getting the resources to do anything about anything because we're not a very populous state. The North Slope Borough has about 8,000 people, uh, most of whom are concentrated in seven villages, two of which are in the interior. Um, there are no roads. Um, the North Slope is an Arctic region. We have sites with incredible preservation. Uh, organic preservation is nearly perfect. Things look like the animal died yesterday. Um, I'm just kind of going through and showing you some, some various things here. Um, there's a lot of fish bones, there's the little arrows. We have really incredible organic preservation. This is a blessing and this is a curse because of course it means that you have a massive amount of post-excavation <laughs> material to deal with where a site in more temperate climes might result in four or five bankers boxes worth of artifacts for the entire collection. We would need two to three shipping containers um, and the labor to go with it. Um, so. Uh, there's all kinds of not only cultural information in these things, but there's ecological information. This is actually an egg that was crushed in an Ipitak house. Um, this is a little bit more recent site. But you see there's a lot of organic material in here. Lots and lots of it. But we have a very serious problem. We have a warming climate that is causing massive erosion problems everywhere. And that's only the beginning. Uh, until recently, we are also suffering from sea level rise. This is an actually a National Historic Landmark and I think something that people are at least talking about proposing for World Heritage. Uh, this is sort of rapidly going underwater. You'll see the water in the house mound. Uh, people did not build their houses in lagoons. So obviously, and this is probably 1,400 years old, maybe. Um, don't have actually a date on that house, but that would be my guess. Um, Here's a site under excavation in the 1930s. Here is a picture at the same location today. Uh, here are two pictures from a site. This is a 2003 picture. That's our helicopter pilot strolling along the beach. This is uh, last week. Um, you notice the monument's a little closer to the edge. <laughs> um, this is what happened two trips to Europe ago. This was an actually a stable site until uh, it had been for as long as I'd ever known it. There was a nice vegetation covered bluff and then there was a storm and then there's a house in the middle of there falling out. We did some excavation. We covered it up. This is what it looked like in uh, August of 2014. There was a fall storm and this is what it looked like in September. Uh, we actually got down there and did some measuring. Um, this is where we were in 2013. We did a bunch of things. This is the 2014 uh, bluff. So 11 meters of a tree in one storm. We covered it all up very nicely uh, and hoped to get some money. And this is what it looks like as of last week. We had another storm. While I've been here, I have been constantly getting emails, Facebook messages, texts, even phone calls about various sets of human remains that have been exposed by the same storm. Uh, there were up to about six different locations by my count uh, in the Barrow area alone. Um, it's, it's, and there's numerous other sites and artifacts that have shown up just from that one storm. So what are we losing here? Well, here's actually a shot, that thing that broke off. This is kind of a view down the crack. This is actually the slump block on the beach. This is the part of the land that's more or less there. Uh, you can't really see the bottom of the crack, but there's close to three meters, as far as we can tell, of intact cultural stratigraphy. Um, this site was believed to have been excavated, but the bottom of the excavation is that plastic sheet. So, um, you know, I, I don't blame the guy that, that did it. It was his dissertation project. It was a really cold year. 
you know, what, you can't, and, and the stuff is frozen solid. You know, you just can't go that fast in this stuff. But um, somehow it wasn't really clear from the report, because I read the same report everybody else had read about Wallachpa, and I really thought, you know, he'd gotten down pretty far. Well, obviously not. Um, so there's just huge amounts of unknown cultural information here, not to mention all of the nice uh, ecological information that's contained in this. And then we have a little bit of a looting problem. There's a bailing bucket that's still there, but there was another, another one over there. There was a pick there just a few days before everything happened. Plus, there's local concerns about human remains. That's actually some unfortunate soul's cranium. As far as we can figure out, the rest of them is in the land where I was standing when I took this picture. Um, but we're not just losing culture. We're losing a lot of basic zooarchaeological information. I mean, all this stuff is beautifully preserved, as you can see. You can do stable isotopes. You can do ancient DNA. You can do trace elements. You can look at corticosteroids and figure out if the individual animals were under uh, threat. Sorry. Um, so you have the ability to look at ecological changes through time. You have the ability to look at potential population bottlenecks. This is an area where there's still subsistence. And the animals that people were subsisting on back then are the same animals they're subsisting on today. People are trying to manage them, and they're trying to manage them in the face of climate change. And they really don't know what they're doing. Uh, the biologists really only have about 30 to 40 years of data um, of the sort that they need to manage it. If that, um, they are not really... Uh, I'm trying to be polite here, but I guess there's probably no, <laughs> no, no management biologist from Alaska here, so I'll just say it. Uh, they really, they, they've not spent a lot of time talking to local people. They really don't understand that these animals have moved their uh, important habitats from place to place. There is a lot of issues around critical habitat designation that uh, are very, very key. And this kind of information will get them to uh, be able to actually manage much more effectively. If you think about it, this is essentially a, a tissue archive. This is a distributed ecological observing network of the past, and it is good through millennia. So today, people go out and they get tissue archives. This happens to be the North Slope Borough Biology Department. That's a bunch of boxes of frozen tissue from animals that were caught by hunters today. And they're all returned to a home base. They store them, and they're available for people to work on. Well, in the past, people went out and hunted, brought stuff back, uh, the items were returned to the home base, and then they threw pieces of them out. But those pieces are still preserved today. What you have there is millennia worth of this, essentially, in an archaeological site. And it's better than, than just taking a column sample in the middle of nowhere, because the, for the residents of the site, we're going out and sampling large amounts of the landscape. So from a, an ecosystem reconstruction, understanding of socio-ecological systems, this is what you need. So, to look at the socio-ecological systems, if you look at this wondrous complicated thing, you don't have to get the details, and if you want them, see me. Um, basically, what people can do with the long-term ecological reserves, the process studies that people do now, it's the short, it's the fast variables, it's the short term. You know, they start collecting data now, 10 years ago, and by the time we get enough data to go through some of the known climatic cycles, it'll be two or 3,000 years from now, and it won't matter anyway. Or, alternatively, they can start getting some of the data that people have already collected for us, fortuitously, in archaeological sites, and actually start addressing some of the slower variables. So, the current U.S. system, so I, then it seems like maybe it's not just the U.S., doesn't really work very well for this kind of a problem, because things are very different. Um, we're set up pretty much to fund research, and... Some of this is, it, we're not really in a situation where the most important thing to be doing is planned research projects. These are 2009 um, permafrost and soil temperature, or active layer depth maps. Um, they were driven by mid-range climate models as of 2009, so these are probably really optimistic. Um, but basically what you need to know for this is blue is good for archaeological preservation, red is bad. Okay? <laughs> so... Notice that, you know, there's all this area here that everything's hunky-dory now, not so hunky-dory in by the end of the century. So, what can we do? Because we have to do something, we can't just sit here. Uh, as professionals, 
want to get together and talk about it. A, we're doing that. That's very good. Secondly, I think adopt a common language that speaks to other disciplines because there's a lot of people out there with much more money than we have. Several people have already alluded to people don't care about heritage particularly, but you get coastal engineering, or you get this, or you get that, and all of a sudden people's ears perk up. Um, there's a whole raft of people out there getting lots of money to do paleoclimates. Well, you know, we can do that. Um, we have, there's a group of us who have actually started talking about sites as nodes in a distributed observing network of the past which is borrowing some language. But essentially, you can see sites as that. Get seats at as many tables as possible. So by that, we mean not just going to archaeology conferences. And try and get some major funders who are non-governmental interested, in, you know, interested in buying into this. With communities, uh, and there's been lots of great examples here. We're a little bit um, behind in the process, maybe in some respects in Alaska also. The U.S. system is such that we can't share site locational data in a public way. I mean, it's pretty much illegal. It's not even subject to Freedom of Information Act requests, um, unlike just about everything else that, that the government does. Um, so, um, you know, we've, we've got some, some issues. The other thing is, of course, that there's not really any cellular coverage in most of the North Slope, as you might imagine. Um, so, um, yeah. Anyway, so but we need to spread the word to the public about the effects of climate change both on, on their, particularly on their local and regional sites. I think people get much more excited about stuff that, that's near and dear to them. Um, develop simple ways for public to update the information. Um, obviously, if you can give them feedback, it's better, but there's an issue. Building capacity for local organizations. Training local people to participate in field work. We've been doing a lot of work with actually high school students, um, although it was a job <laughs> for them. Um, many of them were very interested, but they did need to have a summer job. So. You know, we put the two things together. Provide access to equipment. I think this is probably going to be fairly important for some, some places. You know, there's some of the stuff that we've been talking about is not inexpensive. 3D laser scanning and stuff uh, is really useful for this kind of stuff, but it's not something that everybody's going to have on the shelf. And then being able to provide professional expertise to assist and guide um, that sort of work. So a lot of public outreach, um, media. We've talked and some of this people have gone through. I've been doing a lot with um, Facebook and my blog, and a little bit with Twitter. Uh, Facebook is hugely popular in the North Slope, so it's just turned out to be a really, really good place to find people. But I think you know that's going to differ by community. You know, some people said that they actually had volunteers who were older and weren't really uh, even into the smartphones thing. On the North Slope, that's not an issue. I mean, you've got little old grannies, you know, sitting there on Facebook. So um, it just depends what floats your local target audience's boat, I think, here. Um, you know, this is, this, is, this is as of a couple days ago. Um, it's always good to have coastal storms, because uh, I can tell you there's been more people on, that, on these pages lately, and then just thanks to a whole slew of people um, who contributed. And top right.